Thank you very much, everyone. Um, a pun to, to match your own pun, I'm only in it for the dough. <laughs> Um, so my name is Eimear Gallagher, um, I work in Ashtown, in Chagaskin Ashtown in food research and uh, I focus my research in cereal and bakery science and um, gluten free foods is one aspect of um, my research programme. Um, so today I'm going to speak really quickly about celiac disease, gluten-free foods, gluten-free ingredients. Um, it's something that's very topical at the moment. When I started working in this area back in 2000, people said that I was mad, that it's such a niche market, no one has any interest in it. Why am I wasting my time? Why am I wasting government money time on this research? And in the last number of years, it has just exploded. Um, so just as a brief introduction to celiac disease, um, a celiac disease is what's called an autoimmune disease. So it means when um, a celiac sufferer ingests gluten or eats a piece of bread, their own immune system attacks their own body tissues. Um, it happens, it, the problem actually happens in the small intestine. Um, as you may know, the function of the small intestine is actually to absorb nutrients from the food that we eat. So things like calcium, minerals, vitamins, vitamin A, C, E, K, all of those, um, they're absorbed in the small intestine. So for somebody that has celiac disease, um, their small intestine um, kind of doesn't really work and it results in a malabsorption of nutrients. So people who have celiac disease um, kind of do not have enough nutrients or don't absorb enough nutrients from their food. Um, a celiac disease it, um, affects approximately 1% of the population in Ireland. Um, it could be more. The incidence appears to be rising, but it's still officially at 1%. Um, it appears to be rising because the method of diagnosis of celiac disease has improved an awful lot. Um, before, uh, a number of years ago, it was a very painful biopsy that was used to diagnose celiac disease. Now there is much more um, non-invasive um, test to test for celiac disease like blood tests um, so therefore because the testing is easier it's now it seems to be that more people are suffering from celiac disease but it's just because the testing is easier um, so the symptoms are also very varied and because the symptoms are varied it makes it very difficult to diagnose as well so there is gastrointestinal manifestations or gut problems so that means that people can suffer from bloating from diarrhea from weight loss um, and kind of things that are very visual and that would kind of point to celiac disease quite quickly um, however other people don't have any gastrointestinal manifestations um, they may suffer from migraines from psoriasis of the skin, um, anemia, uh, brittle bones, um, and that can also be linked to celiac disease. Um, and then the third thing would be um, associated complications, things like lactose intolerance. So many celiacs are actually also intolerant to lactose, so they need to be very careful when they're choosing their foods um, to be very careful that there aren't dairy ingredients in those foods as well. Um, now, celiac disease is a lifelong disease, um, so contrary to what many people think, um, if you go on a gluten-free diet, you feel better, so you think you're cured, but celiac disease doesn't actually work like that. You have to strictly adhere to a, a lifelong diet that is gluten-free. And when you do that, the results are kind of very quickly um, seen, the, the improvements. So there is an improvement in the absorption of nutrients from your food, um, the, the lining of your intestines improve, um, and also the, the kind of danger you might have of any long-term complications is, is much less um, once you follow a strict gluten-free diet. So where do you find gluten? Or, what, uh, what foods contain gluten. So of course there's obvious sources like bakery products, biscuits, pizzas, beer, unfortunately the beers down the back are made from barley so they contain gluten. Um, there are also potential or what we call hidden sources of gluten, things you mightn't think of at all, things like lipstick, um, their gravy, stamps, um, the, the gummy part of envelopes, they can contain gluten, um, even pills or tablets um, where wheat flour is used maybe as a binder or as a thickening agent and you wouldn't necessarily associate the kind of gluten with these kind of uh, products at all so you need to be very very careful if you're quite sensitive. 
Um, so as well as the obvious and potential sources, um, there's also cross-contamination. And this can occur anywhere. This can occur in the home, um, or it can occur in restaurants, or in hospitals, or any public places where utensils are shared, or maybe toasters are shared. So you're doing your very best to try and adhere to a gluten-free diet, but that they, maybe the wooden spoon, or the bowl, the mixing bowl, or the, the oven, or the baking tin um, is used both for wheat and for gluten-free products. So of course, cross-contamination occurs. Um, also in the, in the field, um, at the moment there's um, a lot of talk about gluten-free oats and gluten-free oats do exist but you need to be very very careful um, due to cross-contamination especially in the field because that, it can happen very easily. So what exactly is gluten? What causes the problems? Um, where does it originate from? Um, so this is a picture here of um, a grain of wheat um, you get that, that grows in the farmer's fields, then it goes to the millers, um, and millers mill wheat. So what happens when you mill wheat is you take off the outer layers, it's like shading your coat, and then inside, right in the middle here, is what's called the endosperm, and this is where the white flour is found in the, 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 the uh, grain. Um, so this is the white flour. When flour is mixed with water, as you know, I have some samples down there, you get a nice elastic dough. And this elasticity is due to the gluten. So gluten is actually a protein within the wheat flour, and it, it results in the extensibility properties of the dough, um, the, the ability of the dough to be able to mix to form a really nice stretchy um, dough, like when you're making bread or if you're making pizza bases, um, that you're able to, to mold the dough with your hand or put it through a machine. And that's all down to the properties of the gluten protein within the wheat flour. Um, gluten is also um, involved in bread flavour due to different enzymes called gluten-associated proteinases. So therefore, when you remove wheat, how are you going to mimic kind of all this nice stretchy dough, the nice flavour, the nice rise that you get when you're making bread, a nice airy product? Um, so I've been working an, a lot, well, for 17 years, because I'm an old one now, um, using a number of different gluten-free flours. Um, I work kind of in my own lab, and I also work with the Irish food industry with different uh, bakers around Ireland. Um, and we work on kind of looking at different combinations of gluten-free flours. So non-wheat flours that we're using in blends to make breads, biscuits, muffins, uh, pizza bases, anything that will um, help with the celiac diet. And you, um, I've put some of them down the back as well, so you can see a different range of gluten-free flours that is available. Um, so we've looked at things like rice, maize, potato, buckwheat, chickpea, all these different flours. And also in combination with gums to try and get that stretchiness of the dough. So um, things like xanthan gum, carrageenan gum, they're naturally occurring gums that can be used in combination with gluten-free flours. But as you can see on the right hand side there, there's a couple of disasters. It's not easy to mimic wheat. It's not easy to make bread when you're not using wheat flour. So you need to be very careful. So what we have found is we have done a lot of surveys as well and a lot of nutritional kind of testing of gluten-free products in Ireland and around Europe. We tested about 50 different types of bread from Ireland and around Europe. And the, previously we found that they, they have a very dense crumb structure. Um, they're very crumbly because they're not able to rise properly because they don't have the, the stretchiness of the gluten doughs. Um, they can be poor on flavor and poor on mouthfeel. But I suppose the most worrying thing that we found with a lot of the gluten-free products that were available was they lacked nutrition. Um, in particular, things like fat, they were extremely high in fat. Normal wheat bread would be about 1% fat or 1.5% fat, but some gluten-free breads that we found were up to 15 to 16% fat, which isn't great. So you think you're buying a nice gluten-free bread that's really nice and soft, that has a really nice shelf life, it's lovely and palatable in your mouth, but that's because there's loads and loads of fat in it. Also sugar and salt, they're very high in sugar and salt. Um, now I must say that was a number of years ago when we were kind of starting out with our trials with gluten-free. Um, 
but in the most recent years, in the last five, three to five years, um, the, the food industry has become very aware of this, I think, and now there is a, a concentrated effort to try and improve the quality of gluten-free foods, and the quality by quality, I mean the shelf life, the sensory properties, the flavour, um, by introducing more healthy ingredients, oops, sorry, um, things like fibres, lots of brands, flakes, soya bran, um, buckwheat fibre, um, also coupled with alternative proteins to try and boost um, the protein content and also proteins combined with other ingredients to make nice elastic doughs. The so things like egg white, um, chia protein is very popular at the moment, you may have seen it, also chickpea protein. Um, and as you can see here, I just snuck into um, a local Dunn's last week and took a photograph, um, unbeknownst to them, this is their gluten-free section, or this is their free-from section. And you can see that like, there's a huge range now of gluten-free products available on the supermarket shelves. Um, and I think that from kind of the last number of years, I think it's um, just a really good effort between food research and also linking with innovation with the food industry, that the, the quality and the nutritional value is gradually improving now for gluten-free products and also for the celiac sufferers. So thank you very much.